Welcome, everybody, to the Big Book Roundtable and the RICO 12 Family of Recovery Resources. We're grateful to be here with David and Nikki around this roundtable. If you're not familiar with other RICO 12 um, resources that we have out there, please feel free to go to www.rico12.com, R-E-C-O-1-2.com, and check us out. If you have questions or comments that you'd like to to, to make, feel free to send an email to us. We'd love to to hear those and and perhaps address them in a future in a future episode. Um, and if you are feeling uh, urged to do so, please consider uh, supporting Rico Twelve by going to rico 12com forward slash support and making a one time donation. Um, I'm Justin. I am a child of an all powerful, all loving God and a multiple multidisciplinary addict. I'm grateful to be here around this virtual roundtable with David G. and Nikki M. And uh, Nikki, why don't you take just a second, introduce yourself, and uh, we'll get rolling into today's reading here. Hi, everybody, and thank you for your endless service, Justin and David. I'm so grateful to see you today. I'm Nikki M., and I'm a grateful member of many, many, many fellowships, and I'm just so grateful that I made it into these rooms. Many do not, and I'm I have to consider myself a very, very lucky woman today. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. David, introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Thank you, Justin, for your service as always. David G., alcoholic addict of many sorts from Oklahoma. Uh, been sober in the rooms of AA, AAA, SA. Uh, all of that together is about 30 years come August, uh, August 8th of 1994. So thank you. Thank you, Justin. Love it. Thank you, David. All right. Everybody who's out there in the listening audience, grab your big book. That's where we're going to be today. We're going to be continuing in our reading in the chapter, There is a Solution. We'll be reading from page 26, starting with a certain American businessman. So get your big book, get your highlighter, your pen, your paper, get ready to make some notes so that you can be an effective learner, an effective listener, and an effective um, portrayer of the message as you work with others. All right, here we go. A certain American businessman had ability, good sense, and high character. For years, he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. He had consulted the best-known American psychiatrists. Then he had gone to Europe, placing himself in the care of a celebrated physician, the psychiatrist Dr. Jung, who prescribed for him. Though experience had made him skeptical, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. His physical and mental condition were unusually good. Above all, he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. More baffling still, he could give himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. So he returned to this doctor, whom he admired, and asked him point blank why he could not recover. He wished above all things to regain self-control. He seemed quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems, yet he had no control, whatever, over alcohol. Why was this? He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could never regain his position in society, and he would have to place himself under lock and key or hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. That was a great physician's opinion. But this man still lives and is a free man. He does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. He can go anywhere on this earth where other free men may go without disaster, provided he remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. Okay, there's our reading, and there's some history here, so I'm excited to hear what David has on the history side. But first, let's go to Nikki and and talk to us a little bit about some of the things that jumped out at you on this, Nikki. You read my mind. I was like, oh, David G should go first because there's a bunch of history, but I do have experience, strength, and hope with this. And why? Because I'm a certain Canadian woman and I had ability. I had good sense. I had high character. And for years, I floundered not from one rehab to the next. How about from one man to the next man? From, hey, from one country to the next country, because even though I'm Canadian, I lived in America for 20 years. My daughter's born there, Anaheim, California. So, you know, I, I mean, I traveled around and, and this whole paragraph talks about being beyond human aid. You know, I mean, I can go to the best of the best. I could get, and again, it's just all beyond human aid. 
I place my care, you know, myself in the care of the next person, the next, you know, the next job, the next thing that I think is going to be better, that I think it's going to work for me. And it's like, I can do these things for a while. I'll finish a treatment. I'll finish this. I'll get the money. I'll get the, all the ducks lined up in a row. And I'm, and I'm good. I'm really, I'm feeling good. I'm getting my health back. I'm getting things back. I'm not losing things anymore. This is the, the relapse cycle. And, and, you know, I believe after I went to CAMH, the center for mental addiction and health, I believed I had profound knowledge, even four years in the rooms. I believed I had profound knowledge of the inner workings of this disease called alcoholism, you know, because when my body heals, my liar returns and tells me it's okay to do whatever I'm doing again. Isn't that what happens? And it's hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. See, relapse, I'm not going to act like that again. I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to sleep with that person or that person's person again because I'm healed. But when my body and my mind heals, my liar returns and tells me it's okay to do that behavior again. So nevertheless, in a short time, Nikki's acting out in behaviors that I don't want to mention on this podcast, Justin. You know, it's we share in a general way, everybody. I don't need if you want the details, Justin knows how to get a hold of me. You just message us and I'll tell you everything. But um, and more baffling still, Nikki can give herself no satisfactory explanation why I'm doing this again. Well, I have no choice and no control. Remember, I've lost the power of choice. And it's that mental blank spot that we read about, we're going to read about in some of these experiences coming up. And it says, you know, I return back to whatever, you know, back to whatever I'm doing. I I even moved back to, to the America. This time, oh, it's not California. I'm going to move to Arizona. They don't have problems in, in Arizona. Yeah, they do. God, it's beautiful there too. And it says like, you know, why can I not recover? I, what's all happening? Because I wish, that's a log. That is, that's human aid. Wishing, that's for child's play to regain self-control. I've never had self-control. There's the delusion. There's the, I can't differentiate the true from the false, right? Because I'm, I'm rational. I'm well-balanced with respect to all other things. If you guys saw my life, you would go, what Nikki's, this is great. She, she's got it all together. I have nothing together. You know, I had no, I just looked that way yet. I have no control over. And in my book, I put thinking, I have no control over my thinking. Because my first thought leads me to the first action, leads me to the behavior. Why was this? Why? You know, and I know because it's here. It's like the we're going to read it in a couple pages here when we when we get back on page thirty. The idea, the lie that somehow someday I can control my behavior, is the great obsession of every abnormal, you know, thinker, whatever you want to call it. So when I come down here, I love this part where it says. You know, the doctor says all this stuff, but again, that's human aid. You're never going to, you're never, you're never going to regain your position in society. And today I did a step one with a sponsee and I said, you know, we talked about all how her life was unmanageable, all the things she lost. And I had to remind her, but that's not true. You, you can regain this stuff. See, that's not true that you have to place yourself under lock and key, Nikki or hire a bodyguard, or never go into those places, because we talk about it later. Remember, the book repeats itself on page 100. If you're spiritually fit, you can do anything. You can do all sorts of things that addicts, alcoholics, people suffering from the disease of alcoholism is not supposed to do. I don't need to be confined to anything. I can go anywhere on earth, a free man. How about when I can't go anywhere? How about when I lose everything in COVID and I'm stuck in my bedroom, lost no rights, lost my job, can't see my my the man I'm going to marry in Luxembourg, can't get to America. How about this? I can sit in my bedroom alone, a free woman. Because it's all in my head. This is so radical. And I love this. And I'll, I want to hear David G on this. I have to just be willing every day, everybody. They don't put it here, but this is every day. I have to be willing to maintain a simple attitude. And I'm going to tell you what my line out says. That's page 53. The attitude is that God is everything or God is nothing. What is my choice to be? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nikki. I've got uh, some things written down here. Thank you for that, sh for that share and for uh, what do you, uh, uh, your experience, strength and hope was. David, why don't you jump in here and share what your thoughts are and 
I'd love to hear some history behind this too. Sure. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Nikki, AKA Ali. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here today. And thank you for the, for the beautiful share. I, uh, again, I'm David, I'm alcoholic and an addict. And, uh, this is talking about our friend Roland Hazard. And, uh, this man is really, if you look at the, if you look at the lineage, this man is really Bill Wilson's grand sponsor because this man was heavy sponsor. So it says a certain American businessman talking about Roland had ability, good sense, and high character. I thought I had all those attributes for a lot of years in, in AA. And, you know, of course it had changed for the better, but I was still very consumed with self and didn't know that. So from years he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. And I, and I love how Nikki switched that up. I, you know, I, I often say meetings, <laughs> I often, you know, I'll go over one meeting to another. They don't know me over here. I can get away with some of my uh, mischievous over there. So anyway, it says he had consulted the best known American psychiatrist. Then he had gone to Europe. And so the story is, you know, Roland come from a very rich family. He come from the Burlington family. So if you know anything about the Burlington Coat Factory, the Burlington Railroad, this is the family that this man came from, and he had a lot of money. And so his brother was the governor of New York, and his father was the mayor. So there was very promising future ahead for Roland, but he was a drone. And so in those days, particularly at this time, there was no, no airplanes in that day. So to get from one continent, one country to the next, you had to go by ship. So he took a boat all the way to Europe. And he consulted three psychiatrists at that time. One was named Dr. Abner. The other was uh, Sigmund Freud, which some of us are familiar with. And of course, the last being Dr. Carl Jung. And so we're grateful that he ended up with Jung and not Freud or, or the other. Uh, but it says Jung prescribed for him, though experience had made him skeptical. <laughs> He's not quite sure about this guy, you know. Uh, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. And I know that some of us, when we first go through the 12 step process, we do this. And I've seen this be a danger to many people if we get cocky here, especially if we skimp on amends, if we really don't take inventory thoroughly, if we hold on to things in our fifth step. So <clears throat> Roland finishes his treatment with unusual confidence. And no notice what it says his physical and mental condition were unusually good. They don't say much about his spiritual condition here at all. And I think this is what's setting him up. But here's, we've talked about this from the beginning in many of the tapes that I do. Self is made up of, of a set of beliefs, ideas, concepts, prejudice, and attitudes. And we see all of this in what's about to happen to Roland. And if I look back at my experience, this is exactly what happened to me, not only in AA, but in SA and in different fellowships, you know, he believed. And I think that's the key word. Why the hell after a year with that kind of information and that kind of knowledge, would you believe that relapse was unthinkable? Well, I think that self has rebuilt itself here. And it says he believed that he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. I don't see a lot about God or the creator or the source, or I don't see any of that. What I see is him relying on his own beliefs, and let's look what happens to him. And the same thing will most definitely happen to us. I don't care if we're sitting in these rooms day after day after day, working the steps diligently with the sponsor. If I fall hidden, if I fall victim to that belief, and they're going to talk about that on the first example of more about alcoholism, the man of 30. It's going to be the same thing. Nevertheless, he is drunk in a short time, more baffling. Still, he could not give himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. Of course he couldn't. He didn't know what it was. Self has us blinded in that way. So he returns to the doctor. And I love what Nikki read here. <clears throat> he admired him. He really did. He, he had a great admiration for this man. It tells us right there whom he admired. But he asked him point blank this question why he could not recover. And he wished above all things to regain self-control with a little less. This is why he could not recover. See, he wasn't there to recover. He was there to regain control of self, or self was there to regain control of him, is the way I, I like to look at this. 
So he seemed quite rational. It doesn't say he was quite rational. He kind of seemed to be that way. And we can come in here and put on this uh, front for a while. I know I did it for many years. And I seemed to be quite rational, well-balanced. But I had no control over lust and all this other stuff. Why was this? And I love what the doctor tells him. See, Jung could have said, hey, you need to increase your volume dosage. You need to come to more of my treatments. I need some more money. We'll do another year. He didn't say any of that. Jung got honest with him. And he said in the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could not, again, regain the position in society. And like was mentioned, you know, he'd have to go under lock and key and hire a bodyguard. But I love the bottom paragraph. He still lives and he's a free man. Not that he's free of alcohol now and all that. I mean, of course he is. But he's had an experience with the spirit now. That's what freed him. See, we're, we're looking beyond that now. We quit talking about drinking, using lust, and eating all that shit back there, what, three pages ago, page 23. He can go anywhere on the earth that other free men go. I, I've done that so many times. I've traveled to I don't know how many different states and and countries and different stuff now. Uh, I'm a free man today in this area. I just am. I can go there without disaster, but I love what it says. There's a condition. And it's going to be provided that I remain willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. And 10 and 11 is going to play a big part in this for me, a big, big part. And I love what Nikki said, you know, about page 53, having more of this information. But so does page 55 and page 62 as well. There's a lot of stuff about the certain simple attitude in that reading. And uh, I just remember one thing. I don't have any control over self without a power greater than myself. I'm going to die here. And that's just the way it is. So beautiful reading, beautiful uh, to be here with you guys. Thank you, Justin. Um, yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, both of the questions I've written for each of you are on the, on a similar wavelength here. There, there's something that I think that uh, is coming back. So I'm going to start off with Nikki and the question will be a little bit different for you, David, but it'll be on the same type of topic. Um, Nikki, you go ahead and speak to the fit spiritual condition where where you can go without lock and key to places, without a bodyguard. How do you know when you can and should do that? How do you know when you're able to go into these places that otherwise you shouldn't? Well, that's a great question. Well, oh, it's one of the promises, and it says we recoil. I think it's the step 10 promise, isn't it? Where we recoil from it like a hot flame or is yeah i think so i think that's it we're yeah there it is it's it's on page 84 85 it's like how do i know because i have ceased fighting anything or anyone see there here's the step two promise because for this time sanity has returned you know that's how i know sanity's returned i'm not interested as we're seldom interested like, I am not interested in any other man than my guy. This is a miracle. Like, that's not me. I always got someone in the background, even, even this old lady, I'm 50. Like, even maybe you never know. There, There's none of that. It's, I cannot believe God removed it. And it's like, I, I don't want anything but God. If I can't, because remember, I, I've talked about my scrolling addiction. And so if I if I, I get into the doom and gloom of the state of the nations, which I'm not supposed to do, and, and I, and then I get, I'm not recoiling from it like a hot flame, but if, if I know I can go anywhere, any place, anytime, or even more be alone at perfect peace and ease with needing nothing, not needing to go anywhere. Like there, there's two sides to that, not needing to go anywhere or need anything, but God, I'm not interested in any acting out behavior. I'm not even tempted. And if I was, if some, you know, they, they talk about it, if some hot, like they say, even an Eskimo may turn up with a bottle of whiskey. Well, even some guy might turn up with the offer of you never have to work again, full body massages all day. And we're going to grow old in the Garden of Eden. Even if that shows up, I'm going to recoil from all of that like a hot flame. I'm going to act sanely and normally. So I hope that answers it. I have to stay basically... It says on that too, this is how I'm going to react. I'm going to react just like this guy, Roland. I'm going to go anywhere on earth and I'm going to be free as any other human as long as I keep in fit spiritual condition. Now, the question really is, everybody out there, how do you keep in fit spiritual condition? So we can talk about that another day. But, oh, how about follow the exact instructions in the big book? 
What does the book say? Yeah, thank you, Nikki. And that's kind of going to be my question to to David here. And so we'll address that in this one, I think. So, so David, you mentioned that uh, as Roland's there with Dr. Jung, it talked about his physical and mental spiritual uh, condition being good, but the spiritual not being mentioned and the fit spiritual condition. Um, you know, uh, talk a little bit about that in your experience. How do you build spiritual, fit spiritual condition Um like you would mental or physical, so that it is mentioned every bit as powerfully as the other two. Thank you for that question, Justin. That's that's great. And, um, you know, it it took me 25 years to be able to not only answer that question, but live by it. Uh, And Nikki, Nikki hit it right on the head whenever she said, you know, step 10, because in step 10, it tells us that we have entered the world of the spirit. And if I'm there, then I'm in fit spiritual condition. One of the few times it tells us that it's easy in this book is on page 86. And it says that, I mean, 85, it says that we, it's easy to uh, let up on the program of action, which is steps four through nine and rest on our laurels. Then we're headed back to be unfit in our condition again. And so, you know, if we do that, it's very easy to do that. I had a sponsor that used to say, it takes me about five minutes to pick up a bad habit and about five years to to get rid of it. And uh, he said, so be careful with your the way that you live your life. And so when I get to step 10, if I will stay on top of this with prayer and meditation, then I seem to remain in fit spiritual condition. I know it talks about that on page 77 of our book. It talks about, you know, uh, fit spiritual condition. And I know that a soldier, he's he's always getting fit, being ready for battle because he knows what possibly may be coming his way. And that's the same thing with us. I mean, it's, it's not the physical exercise like he's doing, but it is the, the mental and the spiritual exercises as outlined in this book. And once I get to step 10, if I'll continue to watch for those things, which has defeated me and it's not alcohol, lust, but I mean, those are, you know, those are the, uh, are the effects of that. They're not the cause. If I will continue to watch for those things and do what it tells me to do on page 84 of the book, then I've got a whole lot better chance of staying in fit spiritual condition because those times are going to come whenever I'm not ready for that. I know from experience they will. And if I'm not ready, they'll overtake me. And they have in the past. So for me to stay in fit spiritual condition is, and I heard it put this way and I like it. One, two, and three got me connected to God. Four through seven had me connected with myself. Eight and nine reconnected me with you, and ten, you know, keeps me connected with me. Eleven keeps me connected with God, and twelve keeps me connected with you. So, if I want to be in fit spiritual condition, if I'll just remember those things, that's why I put a guy from day one into step ten and eleven. And a lot of people have had fits about that. No, we don't like that. You can't talk about that. Oh, I damn sure can. If you invite me to your meeting to talk, I'm going to talk about my experience, and this is my experience. I put guys there, not because that's anything other than they need something to hold on to other than David or the meetings uh, as they go through this process of the work. And watching thoughts is a big one that helps keep us in fit spiritual condition to make it through the work and have an experience. So that's my experience with that, Justin. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that, David. And and that I think what you just shared there is going to be my takeaway. In fact, I'm going to start off with the takeaways before I t- turn it over to you guys, because I want to remember this. Um, it, when I first started working with sponsees through the steps, it took forever to get them to the God dope. And I was like, and people were dying in that process. So this starting people on steps 10 and 11 gets people to the God dope, to the to, to connect with a higher power greater than me, greater than their sponsor, greater than the rooms, greater than the, making a daily phone call to somebody else. Um, and and that when you introduced that concept to me, David, I think it's been a year or so ago about getting people into 10 and 11 right away. It's made a huge difference. So that's my takeaway. Get to the God dope in this so that my fit, my spiritual condition can start getting fit as I'm going through the steps. Very good stuff. All right, Nikki, what's your takeaway from what we've discussed or read today? Well, the just history repeats itself. We're not doing anything new here. I love like when, you know, Dave was telling us about the history that's Roland. And of course I know the Burlington coat factory. It's about an hour from my house. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, it's just, it's just, this is just history. This is nothing new. 
God is not a new concept. It's facts as old as mankind itself. So I'm just excited to know that um, I, I guess my big takeaway is that I can never stop learning. Like I love this history. I love this lifestyle. And I'm just so exploding with gratitude. Thank you. And thank you, Nikki. David, how about a takeaway for you? Well, I think there toward the end of uh, what you read on page 27 today is really the, uh, the takeaway for me is that, you know, I remain willing to, to uh, maintain, not just achieve, but maintain this certain simple attitude. And for me, you know, the, the concept of, of God, it's not so hard today. It's just not, you know, it's more simple now that I've stepped back, realized that I wasn't him. You're not him. They're not him. That he's he and I'm me. And, you know, I, I have found oneness in that. Don't get me wrong, but I must remain willing. So if any two words that I would take away from any of this that we read today, it'd be those two remain willing to do what's outlined in this book. The experience will come. It will. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you, Nikki. Everybody. Let's work on our spiritual condition. Yes, our physical and mental condition are very important, but in this life, in this path, in this road of happy destiny that we walk together, spiritual fit spiritual condition is vital. Keep coming back. Work that spiritual muscle. It works when I work it, and you are worth it. <laughs>